So some of you may remember that I gave a presentation about two years ago where we basically proposed what's on the first slide here, that maybe there was a sort of gut origin to um, ME and that it might be worth investigating this further. So since that two years, the charity has been very good at raising money and about a year ago we had enough money to establish a UEA based Invest in ME PhD studentship. The student was appointed in October and he's here at the front so he'll answer any questions I can't answer. Um, and we've been busy with ethics. So any of you doing any human studies will know that that is not a minor undertaking and Daniel can probably tell you about that in more detail. But we're virtually ready to go. So it's sort of an exciting time. And in particular because since two years ago there's been an explosion of interest in knowing more about the microbes that live in our gut and how they may or may not be related to a variety of diseases. So, uh, move on. So this is what I'm going to talk about. I'll talk about the GI tract and I'll call it gut just to uh, abbreviate it. And when I say gut, I'm really referring to the small and large bowel. Uh, something about its structure which is important in terms of understanding how it functions and how microbes interact with us barrier function. Then I'll talk a little bit about the microbiota and some of this may be old hash to you but I think it's worth going over some of the fundamental principles and properties of the gut microbes because that really allows us to understand more about how they may be involved in various disease uh, conditions. So it's the, uh, the gut is really the inner tube of life. I mean it's absolutely essential for life. I don't think anybody would argue with that. Uh, this is an endoscopic image here. This is what the gut looks like. These folds and ridges and then going into even more detail, there are these finger-like projections that protrude into the lumen uh, which allow nutrient uptake and provide a barrier function. These are called the villi and it's about nine meters long. So that's an incredibly long uh, organ and what's probably not appreciated enough is that it actually contains the largest immune system in the body uh, and it produces by far the largest amount of antibody and that's primarily IgA. 50 to 70 grams a day are produced and the vast majority is secreted into the gut lumen. And it also contains the second largest numbers of neural cell bodies outside of the brain. So the gut could be considered your second brain, if you'd like. So when somebody says I'm thinking with my gut, then probably not too far. No names mentioned, Ian. Yes. So, as I said, because of these invaginations, these villi that make up the intestine, it gives it an incredible surface area. And current estimates, something like the size of a Babington court. And yet, it's very, very thin. So it's about 30 microns. When that's, that's about half the width of a human hair. So although it's a vast surface area, it's very, very thin and could be considered fragile. However, that's not the only component of the barrier in the gut. There's a variety of multi-layers or components that provide protection to the gut. So we have on the surface of the epithelium, we have mucus. This is sort of uh, gelatinous material that's produced by specialized cells in the epithelium, which provide an effective barrier to keep microbes away from making contact with the epithelium. And then we have the epithelium, we have immune cells, which also help and promote to maintain these junctional complexes which seal adjacent epithelial cells. We have antibody molecules as well, so I said IgA is secreted and that can mop up or neutralize bacteria to prevent them from making contact with the epithelium. And then we have all these microbes here, which in this slide is called fecal matter, but that's gross exaggeration. Lots and lots of microbes. There are as well a protective barrier. They're part of the barrier. They prevent pathogen colonization, for example and they provide essential nutrients which our body cannot produce for itself. So they're an important part of the gut barrier. So in a little bit more detail, there are three uh, microbial organisms that make up the microbiota. There's bacteria, and they're dominated by two phyla, or two uh, large groups, the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes. But then there are other bacteria, there are other organisms as well, the Archaea and the Eukaryota. This is primarily fungus, fungi. The bacteria make up about 10 times the number of fungi. So the bacteria vastly outnumber these other organisms. Just to give you some idea what a bacterium is, is the bacteria, single bacterial cell here on the head of a pin. 
So you can see they're incredibly small. Um, they're about the tip of the pin is 20 microns across, so the bacteria are about five microns, incredibly small. Yet they vastly outnumber us. So collectively, it's been estimated there are maybe 100 trillion um, microbes that reside in our GI tract. And so 100 trillion seconds, just to give you some idea of what this vast number is, is, is several million years. And for the Americans here, this is probably equivalent to your national debt. So <laughs> huge, a huge number. And they probably outnumber us by 3 to 10 to 1. However, what's even more impressive is that for every gene we have, there are about 300 genes that are encoded by the microbes that live in our gut. So less than 1% of the DNA we carry around with us is our own. So the rest is microbial in origin. And this has led to these two terms. So the microbiota refers to all these microbes, a collective community of microbes that live in a particular environment. So the gut contains a microbiota that's unique to itself. And the microbiome refers to the genes. So the microbiome contain, refers to all our genes plus all the genes of our microbes. So when somebody says microbiome, they're referring to the sort of genetic component of all the microbes that live on us as well as us. So the question here is, you know, who's living on who or off who? So some interesting facts. I always like to sort of throw this in just before lunch in particular. Uh, the weight of the microbiome itself is about one kilo. So all the microbes collectively, about one kilo, and that can rise to two kilos in some conditions. Uh, it's about one and a half pints in terms of volume, so it's quite a large number of bacteria. They're very, very complex, so anywhere from 300 to 1,000 species of bacteria, so an incredibly complex population and makeup of bacteria. They're very active. They require 50 to 60 grams 65 grams of hexose a day in order just to maintain their viability. And these are some of the sort of monosaccharides that I'm referring to here as hexoses. And this is some of the foodstuffs that provide that fuel for the bacteria. So all this metabolic activity has to produce things. And one of them, unfortunately, is gas. And it's not just old men and teenage boys that pass a lot of wind, it's everybody. And it's been estimated one to four liters per day. And that's healthy because that's a clear indication of your bacteria performing essential metabolic functions and these are some of the byproducts. And ultimately, this all comes out the other end and about 60% of the weight of the fecal matter is comprised of the bacteria and they can be alive or dead. So it's an incredibly complex ecosystem of microbes that requires, is made up of this complexity and requires all these, this fuel and it's essential for our health and well-being. So how do we know what microbes are actually making up these populations? Well, most of them are very difficult to culture, and probably some people consider them impossible to culture. So it's only with the advent of high-throughput sequencing technologies that we've actually begun to characterize and define the, bac the bacteria that make up our microbiota. And this just gives you an overview of the approach that's taken. So we can isolate DNA from our microbial populations. Usually this is a stool sample. This is then converted by a polymerase chain reaction into uh, ribosomal DNA, which we can sequence, the ribosomes. And the, the ribosomes are indicative or unique to particular types of bacteria. So we can, from this information here, we can identify their origin in terms of the bacteria that these sequences are derived from. So, this can take a couple of days. This bioinformatics can take several months. So you can see where the bottleneck is in this doing all this complex analysis. And this sort of then leads back to, well, what are all these genes doing? What do they tell us about the functionality of the microbes? And so we've got metagenomics, which is basically taking all the sequence information and sort of extrapolating that to function. And as a consequence of this type of analysis, and it relies heavily on the fact that about 80% of the bacterial genes of genes that a bacteria has actually encode a functional protein. So identifying a gene is a pretty good indication that it's a functional gene. And a significant number of gene products that we identify from our microbiota are actually unique to them. We don't have these genes, they do. So there's an important complementarity there in terms of the genetic makeup and the functionality of what we can do and what our microbes in our gut can do. 
And this is sort of the distilling all this information from this type of analysis. The microbiome is highly variable between individuals. Everybody has a unique microbiota. However, that we do share some common elements. So family members, for example, uh, share similar microbiotas than they would to unrelated individuals. Even monozygotic twins have similar variability, um, but they're still distinct. So they're highly similar, but they're still distinctive to basically two genetically identical individuals. And that probably relates to environmental factors that influence this. And we can identify a core microbiota that all of us have. And there are 75 species that are common to about 50% of us. And there are about 50, 60 that are present in the vast majority of us. And we can organize these into what's called enterotypes. Uh, the Bacteroides, Prevotella, and Ruminococcus are the three clusters that we can use to identify three core groups that are present throughout the world in all populations. And two phyla predominate in all individuals, as I said, Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes. And the functional core, so this conservation of these species relates to the fact that they produce or express gene products that are essential for our health. So these are gene products that are involved in degrading complex carbohydrates, uh, providing short-chain fatty acids, producing us with providing us with vitamins and essential amino acids that we can't produce ourselves. So that's probably not too surprising. And so as a result of this and sequencing the microbiomes of various animals, we've come to some sort of conclusions as to why certain species have different microbiomes. This is a network analysis carried out by Ruth Lay when she was in Jeffrey Gordon's group in St. Louis. And uh, this basically maps the microbiota similarity of different animal species. So for example, humans and primates fall here. Um, horses and rhinos make their own cluster up here. And then sheep and cows uh, form another cluster. Uh, elephants are, up, are distinctive from most of these, although there is some overlap with the horses. And then leaf-eating monkeys and pigs sort of fall outside the primates and some of the other species. And what this, and the carnivora as well, so lions and bears form this own group. So what this says is that who we are and what we eat shapes our microbiota. Um, so that's sort of quite a profound statement. It's based on this sort of evidence, which is quite compelling. So diet is clearly a factor, but our genetics as well is another major factor that determines the makeup of our microbiota. And this sort of more recent study clearly illustrates this. So look at, this is looking at the microbiota of two populations, one in Burkina Faso in Africa that uh, exists primarily in a rural diet. And this, these are individuals actually in Italy that have a Western diet. And it's not important that you look at the numbers. You can see the colors are very different, reflecting a very different composition of the microbiota, uh, which, inf which is indicative of a strong influence of diet on the makeup of uh, the microbiota. What's not been really mentioned at all today is that the microbiome also contains lots of viruses. And the vast majority of these uh, are viruses that live inside bacteria, so-called bacteriophage. And the feces contain up to 10 to the 9 virus-like particles per gram. So it's a vast number of um, viruses. As I said, they're mainly um, phages, so these are viruses that infect bacteria. And there are two types. They're called the temperate phages, which are very stable. So they don't really change their genetic makeup over time. But then there are lytic phages called the microviridae, which have very, very high mutation rates. As you can see here, more than uh, for every new, so for every nucleotide, there are, ten to, there are 10 to the 5 nucleotides per day that are changed. Um, so this incredible rate of turnover and mutations in these viruses. Not surprising, there's similarities among related individuals. The co-twins and mothers share a significantly greater degree of similarity in their virome. And viromes are unique to individuals, uh, regardless of their genetic uh, relatedness. And so the interpersonal diversity comes through the persistence of the temperate phages, but also the rapid evolution of some of these uh, lytic phages. And the functions embedded within these viruses may provide in the future, clues as to gut health or signatures of health and maybe predisposition or uh, susceptibility to developing various disease states. So there should, I think, be more interest as the time goes by in looking at the viruses that make up the microbiome as well as the bacteria. And 
just here as well. So I said, you know, bacteria, a huge number of bacteria. Well, the viruses outnumber them by about five to one. So clearly, viruses predominate. So where does the microbiota come from? The simple answer is our mothers. Uh, they're the major source of the microbes. Uh, babies are born sterile, and so as they are born, they get exposed to the microbes within the, the uh, reproductive tract or on the skin if they're delivered by cesarean section. And then these other factors will also determine what contribution microbes from other sources will make up that initial colonization of the newborn. So as I said, the mode of delivery, vaginal or cesarean, has a big influence. Um, <coughs> infant nutrition, so breastfed versus bottle fed. Uh, hygiene measures, so born in a hospital, born at home, elsewhere, all these things will impact on the types of microbes that can colonize the newborn. Uh, and then the gestational age, the premature infants will have a different type of uh, microbial exposure. And then it, whether or not there's any intensive care required for um, the newborn or whether it's a normal transition into the hospital ward. And then later on, antibiotic exposure will obviously have a big impact on the makeup and the development of the microbiota and hygiene measures as well. So the mother is the primary source, but all these environmental factors impact on the makeup and development of the microbiota. And this has been looked at over time, over, over aging, and there are three periods where there are significant changes in the microbiota. As I've said at birth, and you can see here that different types of bacteria initially colonize and then their numbers wane over time. Transition from um, liquid food to solid foods, another important time as the nutrients change, so does the makeup of the bacteria in the gut that's able to utilize these nutrients. And aging as well. We now know that there's profound changes and shifts in the microbiota related to aging, and this may be related to frailty, uh, immunosenescence, uh, and suscept increasing susceptibility to a whole variety of diseases that we associated with aging. So there's a lot of interest in this at the moment, and at the Institute of Food Research, we have programs looking at how the microbiota changes with age, and particularly how it changes in the elderly. So why is it there? Well, I've sort of given strong clues already, and there are perhaps three primary criteria that are fulfilled by the microbiota. They, are a, they have a protective function. They prevent colonization. They fill the space available in the gut, from limiting colonization from pathogens. Um, they can deprive pathogens of nutrients, so starving them to death, if you like. And they can actually produce antimicrobials that can kill pathogens as well. And then they have this structural function. So they help promote and maintain the intestinal barrier. They stimulate the growth and turnover of epithelial cells that make up this barrier. And they're important for stimulating the maturation of the immune system as well. And as I said, they can also make sure the junctions that seal adjacent epithelial cells are tightly regulated. And then the metabolic functions as well, which I've also mentioned. Um, so they metabolize, they can metabolize carcinogens and toxins. They synthesize essential nutrients, vitamins, folate, for example. And they can ferment lots of non-digestible dietary uh, residues. And it's perhaps this sort of fermentation that's really the key to the essential nature of the microbiome. So we can regard the intestine as a bioreactor. Here we have the small intestine. So we have the, the input here, the ingested carbohydrates. The simple polysaccharides and monosaccharides are, are absorbed um, in the small intestine. The un, more complex plant-based polysaccharides pass through to the colon, where they undergo ferment, fermentation, gradual breakdown by the bacteria. And this leads to the production of these short-chain fatty acids, which are essential fuel for the body. And it's been estimated that in humans, about 5 to 15 percent of our daily energy needs from these short-chain fatty acids is provided by bacterial fermentation in the colon. In some species, it's even higher. It could be 30 percent of their needs. And what's interesting is that the enzymes responsible for this fermentation are very sparse in our own genome. So we only contain maybe 20 of these hydrolase-containing genes, but one bacterium that lives in the gut, Bacteroides thetaiota micron, contains 260 
of these genes in its genome alone. So we multiply that by all the other bacterial species that contain these genes, and you can see that they're ideally suited to be able to digest these polysaccharides that we otherwise would be poorly equipped to um, digest and metabolize. So the microbiota performs an essential role in providing us with our daily energy needs. And there's some examples here of just how we've evolved to accommodate these microbes. So the, ex the example here is an elephant. This is the cecum, which can be uh, considered as a, a fermenter. And this makes up about 12% of its body weight. So it's about 500 kilos. So clearly it's evolved a digestive tract to accommodate the bacteria that are required to extract the maximum nutrients from this rather poor uh, energy containing foodstuffs. And the koala bear, another example, it has the longest cecum of any animal. It's about 2.5 meters long. And again, this is to accommodate the microbes it needs to extract the maximum level of nutrients from its energy poor diet uh, that it subsides on. And in humans, there's an example here that I have. So the genes encoding enzymes that are, that are able to digest seaweed are rare outside of Japan and its, <coughs> and its indigenous populations. And these genes have been shown to originate from aquatic bacteria that were consumed while eating seaweed. And these genes have then been acquired by members of the microbiota of these populations to allow them to utilize this as a food source. Um, because seaweed is generally not part of the diet outside of Japan, not many people outside Japan have the bacteria able to um, digest and extract nutrients from the seaweed. So that's a recent adaptation of, of humans there. So we, we know that the um, microbiota is essential for health through experiments done in animals that are essentially sterile. These are called germ-free animals. And these are essentially kept in germ-free or bacteria-free isolators. And we know from studying the physiology and biology of these germ-free mice that there are certain physiological defects these animals have. So they have a defective epithelial barrier, so a leaky gut. They have defective lymphoid tissue development. They have a poorly developed immune system. They're incredibly susceptible to infections. And this, in part, is attributed to defective IgA production in the gut and increased susceptibility to infection. All of these things can be... Uh, restored by exposing these animals to uh, an external environment where microbes can colonize the mice. So germ-free animals are an important tool that we have for investigating um, the relationship of the microbiota and its importance for, for health. <coughs> However, there is a flip side to this in that they can, under some conditions, cause quite significant disease. So they came from within. So we do have potential pathogens. These are called pathobionts, and these are probably some of the more commonly uh, accepted pathobionts. So Helicobacter pylori, you've heard about already today, associated with stomach cancer and ulcers. Clostridium species can, can, can cause quite um, um, dangerous infections. And we also know that the energy production, the amount of energy the microbiome biota can produce, can in some individuals lead to an excessive uh, output of short-chain fatty acids, more than the body requires, and this has been linked to um, excessive weight gain and, in some cases, obesity. So, you know, there are, there's always a bad side to this, and so it's important that we're able to um, identify these potential pathogens and means by which the microbiota can contribute to health so we can identify ways of, of preventing it or treating it. And not surprisingly, as I said, there's been an explosion of interest in the microbiota and linking it to human diseases. And I've illustrated here some of the associations of alterations in the makeup or behavior of the microbiota, so-called dysbiosis, which has been linked to disorders of the central nervous system, the heart, liver, not surprisingly, the GI tract, and in particular, inflammatory bowel disease, the Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Type 1 diabetes, as I referred to earlier, in terms of energy metabolism and lipid metabolism. Rheumatoid arthritis um, and hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism. However, for all of these diseases, there isn't one bacteria within a microbiota that's been identified as being uh, a causative agent. It's more the makeup and the metabolic output, probably, which relates to uh, changes in some of these 
normal physiological functions that predisposes to disease. So moving now more closely into sort of the projects that we're interested in, the microbiota gut-brain axis. And here I've tried to summarize uh, the evidence for a link between the gut and the brain. And I think probably one of the most important things here is this, that bacteria are a source of many stress-related neuroendocrine hormones, in particular catecholamines, which we know can have direct effect on the brain. Um, <coughs> and we also know that there is a bi this is a bi-directional communication. There are factors, pr stress mediators produced in the central nervous system, which can impact on the microbiota, uh, its composition and its function. And there are beneficial effects of altering the microbiota through probiotic therapy, which can help with cognitive dysfunction. Microbial dysbiosis has recently been associated with autism and depression. And we know intestinal infections can negatively impact on memory and learning. So there's increasing evidence of a direct link between what goes on in our gut and our, the way our microbes behave and how that can impact on uh, the central nervous system. We've known for over 40 years that environmental stress can impact on the microbes in the gut. So this is an experiment done by Dwayne Savage uh, in 1974. And he simply withheld food for 48 hours from mice and then looked at the type of organisms that were associated with the epithelium in the gut. And these are, uh, this is the gastric epithelium. These are yeast cells in an animal that's um, been given access to food. And this is the animal that's been starved of food for 48 hours. And you can see there's a change in the numbers and the shape of, of these yeast cells. So here, there are many of them. Here, they are relatively sparse and they've changed their shape in response to the withdrawal of food. The paper also describes changes in bacteria in the lower GI tract, and I think this sort of underpins a lot of the work that's going on now, looking at how food, diet, nutrition can impact on the bacteria that are present uh, in the GI tract. Uh, this slide you've already seen before, I think it's, it's sort of a very seminal study showing that the microbiota can modulate brain activity, and in particular, um, <laughs> in regards to affecting motor control and anxiety behavior in adults. This is, these are mouse experiments. And this is a very recent study from a group in the United States showing that microbiota can modulate uh, behavior in a mouse model of autism. And they related this to the presence of a bacterial metabolite, so a metabolite produced by the bacteria in the gut, that was able to access the bloodstream because of a leaky gut and that these metabolites directly impacted on the central nervous system of the mice. And this could be improved or restored by probiotic treatment. So administering a single bacteria that was able to change the behavior of the microbiota, improve or restore the barrier function, reduce the leakiness of these metabolites, and then this ameliorated some of the specific autism-like uh, conditions in the animal. So this, again, this is increasing evidence that there's a clear link between what goes in our gut and the types of activity that goes in our gut that uh, can relate to the central nervous system. So that then brings me to the project we're undertaking in Norwich. And this is the question that we're asking. Is there a role for a leaky gut and the intestinal microbiota in ME? And this was the beginning of the campaign to raise funds for the project. So is, is this where the cause of ME lies? And these here illustrate the partners in this project. So the Institute of Food Research, University of East Anglia, the Genome Analysis Center, which is based in Norwich as well, the Epsom and St. Helier University Hospitals, this Amalak Bansal, who's um, helping us access the patients, and the Perbright Institute, where we'll be analyzing the microbiome from patients, in particular looking at the virome component uh, in these individuals. So the two questions again, do alteration in the intestinal barrier integrity and the microbiota exist in ME patients, some, all, maybe none? Is there evidence of immune system exposure and autoreactivity to commensal microbes in some, all, or none ME patients? And so if there is intestinal permeability, then it can have quite significant consequences which could account for some of the symptoms described in ME, malabsorption, inflammation, maybe a defective blood-brain barrier, um, so all of these could potentially be linked to a leaky gut. We can detect the presence of a leaky gut um, 
In the hospitals, this is using confocal laser endo microscopy. So patients are injected via a vein of a fluorescent a probe. This is a healthy intestine. You can see all the fluorescence. The dye is contained within the villus here. There's none in the lumen. This is an intact gut. And this is a patient with inflammatory bowel disease. And you can see this plume of fluorescence that's coming out of the epithelium, which is indicative of a leaky gut. And in patients where this can be restored, they have a very good prognostic um, indicator. So this, if this can be sealed or healed, then the patients generally uh, have a good prognosis and will remain disease-free for a significant period of time. So we do have the means by which we can look for the presence of a leaky gut. And in terms of things that can cause the leaky gut, there are a variety of things, some of the things you've heard about already. Dietary proteins and peptides, the presence of antibodies and drugs, physical stress, infections, cytokines, neurotransmitters, enzyme. All of these can have a negative impact on the integrity of the gut barrier. And once the barrier is breached, then there's an immediate sort of cascade of events that can result in immune system abnormalities, chronic stimulation, overstimulation, that leads to some of the sort of indicators of inflammation you've heard about today. Potentially, this could then set the stage for autoimmunity, which could influence the blood-brain barrier and autoimmunity. Obviously, there are lots of questions here that need to be addressed to substantiate this, but it's, it's, at least it's a feasible pathway which we can start to investigate. And this just shows that bacteria can take advantage of a leaky gut. So here's a healthy gut. This black area is the mucus, which I said provides a barrier to keep the bacteria away from the epithelium. Here you can see we've got a breach in the barrier. And down here in the crypts between adjacent epithelial cells, this fluorescent bacteria that are labeled green here, you can see they're starting to contact and actually invade the epithelium. So Normally, the bacteria are kept out here, but if the barrier is breached, then some can take advantage of this to cross into the body and cause um, con uh, serious consequences. And not surprisingly, intestinal permeability has, has many disease associations, food allergy, celiac disease, probably the obvious ones, certainly inflammatory bowel disease, asthma, arthritis, heart failure, diabetes. It's a long list, and it will probably grow even longer. <coughs> and in some cases... It seems to precede disease. In others, it seems to be concomitant with it or maybe follow it. So again, they're um, sort of indirect evidence of this. I'm getting the finger, so I should finish quickly. In terms of the microbiota and ME, um, this is the evidence that we have so far. So many ME patients have GI disturbances. The microbiota has been altered in the studies that have been done so far. Uh, there are change in the nature of the bacteria that are present in the stool samples. And this is a study that was referred to earlier by Maddie. This is Thomas Barodi in Sydney, who's doing transcolonic bacteria therapy, basically 13 bacteria mixed together and administered to patients. This sort of fecal microbiota-like transplantation is not new. Chinese have been doing this for centuries, so-called yellow soup. Uh, veterinarians have been doing it for 100 years, transformation. And then the first experiments in humans about 50 years ago uh, to treat recalcitrant C. difficile infection. Since then, it's been extensively used, and there are no cases that I'm aware of of any adverse effects. So it seems to be safe. It seems to be effective. Um, There's further evidence of linking a leaky gut with alterations in neurotransmitters. This is a recent paper. Uh, bacterial translocation associated with autoimmune responses directed at neurochemicals as serotonin. Uh, consistent with MB being an or neuroimmune disorder. Probiotic therapy, somebody asked about this. These are the only cases I could find that seem to indicate there's potentially some beneficial effect of using probiotics. And this is what we're proposing to do. Um, so with Amalax help, we're trying to recruit patients into our study. Uh, Amalax Clinic in St. Helier and Epsom has about 1,000 patients, so potentially a large number of patients. We'll collect stool, blood, urine, and maybe intestinal biopsies. We'll assess intestinal barrier permeability. We look for the evidence of, of lymphocytes that can circulate to the brain. Um, and we'll look for alterations in the microbiota itself. And we'll also, in particular, be looking for viruses, changing the virome, which may be indicative of uh, ME or diagnostic of ME. 
So permeability, this is the method we use here. It's basically taking um, sugars that are poorly absorbed in the normal intestine and are not digested by the microbiota. Patients with a leaky gut, the sugars cross the gut barrier and they can be measured in the urine. So the presence of these sugars in the urine is indicative of intestinal permeability. However, it's not foolproof. There are a variety of reasons why it may not be uh, used extensively by clinicians. So what we're doing is taking a different approach and we're looking for evidence of an immune footprint of exposure uh, to intestinal bacteria. So we're developing a slide-based assay, so a high throughput screening assay, where we'll immobilize uh, microbes that we've isolated from the gut microbiota, immobilize these on slides, and then look for reactivity in patient sera. We'll do this alongside more conventional diagnostic tests for looking at GI disorders, so looking for these reactivities as well. But this will allow us to identify, have the, has the patient been exposed to their own microbes? If they have, which ones? And we can then investigate that further to hopefully sort of identify reactivity profiles, and we can confirm autoimmune reactivity using the patient's lymphocytes. And what this may lead to eventually is evidence-based therapeutic interventions uh, for treating ME. And this is just looking at the brain. So how can we identify lymphocytes that circulate to the brain? Well, there are these molecules called integrins that are made up of two different polypeptide chains. Co different combinations of these polypeptide chains and integrins allow leukocytes, white blood cells, to circulate around the body and then to tether, roll, become activated, undergo arrest and then, trans and then cross the capillary boundary. So you can see here there are a variety of mixtures of these and these are of particular interest to us because these are linked to homing to the gut or homing to the brain and these relate here to, to antibodies that have been developed to try and block this homing which are proving to have some beneficial effects in certain disease states. So we'll look for evidence of these brain circulating homing uh, lymphocytes in patients. So this is my last slide. And we have a small village, maybe a hamlet, if you like, looking at this. So Daniel is the PhD student sponsored by Invest in ME. He's sitting down here at the front. Amalak, oh, this is Barat, who's a UEA medical student who's involved. He's also here, not quite as well dressed as he is there today. <laughs> and Amalak, of course, is absolutely key to our patient recruitment. Tom Wildman is a virologist, as is Eleanor Kopman. I don't have a photo for her, um, who are very interested in looking at the virome of the patient. So I'm sorry. I've overrun, um, but I hope you will go away and feed your microbiota. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry it's taken so long, but I don't apologize, really. I think it's quite interesting, some of the stuff that's going on, what happens. Let's have a question. Yes, please. I'm recalling a, an article, I think it was in Pediatrics, which showed that when mothers were treated for six months with probiotics before delivery and mother and baby for probiotics for six months after delivery, they had a 90% ch lower chance of developing autoimmune disease. Do you think this is a possible explanation of why there's a connection, a weak but real connection, between ME in mothers and their offspring? Um, I don't know, to be honest with you. but. But um, I can tell you that there are studies being carried out in Scandinavia where um, mothers are being administered probiotics to try and uh, prevent their offspring from developing allergies uh, and asthma. And there's some evidence that can be quite effective. So it may be possible. And that would, that, the experiments done in Scandinavia and Finland, I believe they are, uh, would suggest that there's something there worth investigating in terms of other conditions maybe ME. Shortly before she fell ill in early 2000, uh, my daughter suffered from what the local medical services called stomach migraine. Now, I've sort of wondered ever since whether there was any connection between the stomach migraine and the ME, and your work suggests that there might be. Any, any comments? Well, I mean, we know that the microbiota, there are bacteria that make up our microbiota that can produce uh, neurotransmitters, I mean, catecholamines, things that can affect 
enteric neurons which will feed into the central nervous system. So it's entirely feasible. I don't know though if anybody knows of any studies that have been actually done to look at that in more detail. But in terms of what we know about the microbiota and what it can produce, there is a potential there to directly influence um, neurotransmission in the gut but also in the brain through the production of um, these various neurotransmitters. So, highly possible. Okay, well, thank you very much.